Well, thank you for coming today. Um, I want to take you to um, the parish of Cumbernauld in 1657, when the elders and the minister of the Kirk um, got wind of a concealed pregnancy involving a woman in the obscure area of Dulleter. Now, cases of sexual impropriety were the regular stomping ground of the Kirk session. But this case was different. It centered on a woman who you'll have likely never heard of and probably will never hear about after this evening. Her name was Agnes Imick, and through her, I hope we can obtain a new perspective on Scotland's medical history. The reason for this is that the Kirk Session clerk described Agnes as a dumb woman. So neighbors discovered in October that Imick was pregnant with an illegitimate child. Neighbors and members of the church court visited her home where she lived with her sister to discover the identity of the child's father. Upon their arrival, the visitors quickly realized that Imic was not able to verbally communicate with them. Instead, they attempted to understand her side of the story through what the clerk referred to as the nature of her signs, nonverbal communication. Imic's sister served as the main interpreter in the days following the birth of the child. And through lengthy and often quite touching conference, the session discovered how Imic sometimes implicated a local man named John Allen, and at other times his son, annoyingly also called John Allen. <laughs> now both men vehemently denied the charge, forcing the session to ask neighbors for advice regarding the best way to comprehend Agnes's signs with greater precision. Unfortunately, Emmett's neighbors were not able to understand the distinctions between her gestures either. And this is where this comes in. Some neighbors um, complained that occasionally she signs the child to be the old man's, but sometimes the young man's. And in this one, the session clerk described how Emmett tried to convey that her child's father had long hair through gestures by forcing her hands down the side of her face. One neighbor, Barbara White, speculated that both men may have slept with her as the latter held up two fingers, which the neighbor thought was a sign that Agnes had laid with two men. Another neighbor, I don't know how this worked, suggested that Imic had tried to convey to him that the elder John Allen had taken her to his chamber while she was baking bread although he never really describes the signs that she used to describe this scenario. An impasse is reached in this disciplinary case, and it lasts for almost two years. And it's only partly broken when the session asks the elder John Allen to stand by his denial on oath. He continued to deny the charge, and the session was therefore unable to proceed any further. With no proof, and with Alan's oath and word against Agnes's difficult to interpret signs, the case disappears from the session book altogether. So although Agnes Imick left no written words behind, these are intermediary and proxy statements, her case provides an entry into a world that historians of Scotland, as well as elsewhere, have struggled to comprehend. It's pre-modern disability. And what I want to do for you this evening is to show you how one particularly dominant institution in the 16th and 17th century in Scotland, the Kirk of all places, viewed disability. And in so doing, I want to push our views of Scottish disability far back than hitherto possible, but also to present you with a very early social history of disability in Scotland. Now, I hope I'm not going to get any kind of arguments about this at the end, but my suggestion is that historians have struggled to see early modern disability at all because they've been looking in the wrong places. What I'd like to propose to you is that one particular institution in the parish was so pervasive in this period that it could rec record a vast range of details about what 
one might call the everyday. And this is the Kirk Session. Now, Kirk Sessions operated in all lowland parishes by the turn of the 17th century and staffed by a combination of ministers and local, uh, and local laymen. These sessions investigated morality, sexuality, and also played a central role in distributing alms. These records are the place where disabled parishioners are mentioned with greatest frequency in this period. But until now, nobody has systematically assessed this stuff. So the first place we observe disabled parishioners in these documents are in the quite massive lists of payments made by Kirk Sessions to those who they felt deserving of alms. And Sessions regularly distributed money to those with both seen and unseen disabilities, as, as these entries show. In August 1647, the session at Dunfermline noted that most of the parish's paupers consisted of those who the clerk called aged, decrepit, lame, blind, bedridden, and some idiotic. We see entries like this in Kirk Session registers across the country. So for example, the session at Dice near Aberdeen recorded giving money to a poor cripple man carried on a barrow, as the image by Cranach the Elder shows. And then in the borders, the parish clerk of Hutton recorded a small payment to a cripple born on a barrow in 1657. The position of the disabled is revealed by the Kirk Session records and, of course, the contemporary rhetoric and words that we find quite difficult to digest was far more than simply a target for charity, though. And I'd like to present you now with a more complex picture in which those with disabilities in this period presented fundamental challenges to the Kirk Session's infamous drive for moral discipline. Now, unsurprisingly, the disabled were not exempt from what many of you will know as the Kirk's quest for moral reformation in this period. And while those guilty of disciplinary infractions might find themselves ordered to sit or stand on an object like the stools of repentance here, those with physical difficult, uh, disabilities could find it difficult or impossible to perform the necessary gestures of public repentance. So in 1658, the session at Collington was aware that Barbara Eckford, a parishioner found guilty of fornication, suffered from epilepsy. The session allowed her to perform public repentance from a low seat to both maintain the dignity of the spectacle of the act, but also to maintain her physical safety in case she fell in the event of a seizure. The session of Kilconqua and Fife absolved Eupham Toddy from public repentance because of her frequent fits of convulsion, risked what the clerk called exposing herself and the whole congregation to great trouble. Such actions served to protect the penitent in some ways, but the primary intention here was to protect the dignity of penitentiary acts. wrong keyboard. <laughs> now, cognitive disability presented more fundamental challenges to this kind of thing. In Dalkeith, local ministers discussed the case of Janet Haldon throughout the 1640s. Locals suspected Haldon guilty of infanticide, but could not proceed to punishment because she was described by the clerk, again, as a non-confessant fool. In late 1653, Patrick Thompson in East Lothian complained that Marion Simpson had slandered him by calling him a warlock of all things. The session clerk recorded how Marion was a distracted woman. She admitted that she said Thomas, um, Thompson looked like a warlock, but they couldn't continue the investigation with her. That was all that they could get. And as a consequence of this, Kirk Sessions would enter into conference with friends, relatives, and carers of the accused. In October 1648, the minister of Daviot admitted that he found it difficult to discipline a local woman, Margaret Knuckle, who he described as foolish and furious. The presbytery asked the minister of a neighboring parish to confer with her because he had experience of similar cases. 
Now, these conferences underline how Kirk leaders felt that it was essential for offenders to appreciate the gravity of their offense before repenting in front of the congregation. But of course, cognitive disability presents challenges to this interpretation. For example, throughout 1653, the ministers and elders at Dunfermline confirmed with James Primrose for committing fornication. The clerk noted that Primrose oftentimes takes a fit of a distracted humor and that the session should immediately dispatch a delegation to confer with him. Unfortunately for the session, the elders observed that their visits coincided with Primrose being presently in a distemper, as they thought. And by the autumn, the session had abandoned the process altogether, considering he still considers distracted and that he is not capable of censure, and this is the key bit, nor sensible of his sin, nor can try himself therein. The session's concern here was that Primrose not only lacked the contrition, but also the ability to adequately reflect on his offense. And while this appears remarkably intolerant by modern standards, I hope, this actually reflects in the 17th century how the church continued to see those with disabilities as worthy of the effort, as part of the community. Now, the challenges posed here by cognitive disability could sometimes lead to sessions abandoning cases altogether or accepting some token acknowledgement from the offender. So in 1654, the session at Whittingham asked for advice from the ministers of the region because of the matter of, of a man they referred to as an idiot who had fallen in fornication. The minister was concerned about the man's ability to perform repentance, quote, he not being able to speak one word in sense that we can understand. It's the idea of understanding the repentance that's key. Now, similarly, in 1656 over in Kintyre, the, set, the presbytery decided to confer with a local man in secret before allowing him to repent publicly for adultery for the same kind of reasons. This normal process of public apology and reintegration was therefore undermined by the involvement of a parishioner who could not, they perceived, could not understand the practice or could not engage with it through speech acts. Now, local authorities were particularly willing to accept a private form of repentance if the underlying condition had been the cause of the offence. And this was particularly true of lesser crimes like swearing or slander. The session at Tayport, for example, found Margaret Murdo guilty of swearing in autumn 1653, but noted here considering that she was but a fool, thought it fit to not bring her to repentance in public. Notice that they kind of threaten her with more significant punishment uh, if she uh, offends again. And of course, Sessions wanted to avoid any further social scandal if forced to present the offender to the public seat of repentance. But they're also trying to mitigate the impact of parochial discipline on a small, uh, a small subsection of the community. And this all kind of comes back to this idea that sessions were desperate to avoid potentially scandalous behavior spilling out into the public view. The session at Pittenweem, for example, appointed two individuals to wait on an, um, an unnamed distracted woman overnight in February 1654. In 1657, the Sessions of Edinburgh asked the elders and minister in the Canongate to take some effectual course with a woman named Fife Douglas, who they described as a cripple, found guilty of unsober and unchristian carriage in the street. The Sessions' remedy was to ask that neighbors in the area keep her indoors to prevent further scandal. And though we're not totally absent in such cases, the language surrounding cognitively disabled parishioners was rarely about protecting them. Rather, such cases focused on protecting the morality of their neighbors. Such attempts to keep social scandal driven by cognitive disability away from the sight of most parishioners meant further pushing disability into a private and mainly domestic setting. And Sessions sought to mitigate such risks, interestingly, by suggesting adjustments to living conditions. And this is to reduce, again, that, um, 
potential chance that those with cognitive issues might cause offence. So the Kirk session at Peebles ordered that a local man named James Scott should harbour a woman called Janet Robeson who had become frantic in 1657. The session clerk noted how Robeson, having no friends to care for her, was suffered to stay in the streets and fields to the hazard of her own life and the hazard of others. From the session's perspective then, obtaining some form of agreement from the carer was essential for the system to work, but they pushed this into a different setting. So what does this all tell us about early modern disability in this brief? presentation. Well, firstly, it suggests that we can recover some of their experiences. We can push the narrative further back in time. But there are also two other key considerations here for us to think about. First, those with disabilities were far more than simple targets for charity on those lists that I showed you. The efforts that authorities went to to get disabled parishioners to repent for their bad behavior reflects Heather Kirk saw the disabled as part of the community of the faithful. They make no judgments about who's going to be saved and who isn't. But practically, the Kirk's concern for stability was far less inclusive. Those with potentially disruptive disabilities as they perceived it were increasingly closed away from the rest of the congregation. And prior to the development of dedicated institutions, this meant keeping disabled parishioners indoors with their families, with carers, with friends. And while sessions were compassionate, of course, to the disabled in general, this closeting of disability led to far less tolerant attitudes towards some forms of behavior that over the longer period were considered abnormal. So from a careful reading of these sources that perhaps we wouldn't have thought to use before in a medical humanities context, we can push the history of disability in Scotland far further back in time. But we can also understand the very different experiences of disability in early modern Scotland. Thanks very much. Thank you. I, I really want to ask how on earth you decipher all of those different kinds of handwriting. They're quite astonishing. <laughs> But it, it, it's very striking in some ways, listening to the talk, listening to the kinds of language that's used here. They talk about idiots, they talk about mm -hmm. um, uh, distracted people, fools, people who are frantic. I think you said people who are natural as well. Yeah. Is, is there any sort of overarching frame here, or are these seen as, you know, just as it were, different kinds of sinners, the way that the church sees sort of most people? That is a very good question. <laughs> so... As I, as I learned from a, a very good sociologist friend of mine, it's problematic in this period to try and create a typology um, with any precision. Um, so trying to ascribe certain causes and certain symptoms is, is, is very difficult. And of course, we're seeing this through the lens of a scribe who is interested in something very different. So what we're doing is we're looking at ephemeral detail. So in that respect, the precision is disappointing if we want to do that. But firstly, it's all we have. <laughs> but secondly, there are certain terms. Um, so um, use of, of um, ideas regarding lucidity, for example, which we can use to kind of gauge this, um, the severity of a disability. But it's very difficult to gain a comparative insight, mainly because even within the same document, I mean, you said the handwriting is hellish, but, that's my word, sorry. <laughs> but, um, but one scribe will go from using one epithet to another within two folio, so, which drives my students mad, but it also means that we, we, have a, we have great difficulty kind of bringing up that typology. So in short, I'm afraid we, we can't read them. I wonder if you could say a wee bit more about um, disabled people at that period in time and kind of the Calvinist view of who was saved and who wasn't saved, because I was really interested in your, your view about bringing disabled people into the community when you think about concepts of the elect and all that stuff. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question. Um, 
I could easily plug my book here. Um, this is chapter one and two. Um, so, interestingly, the, those with disabilities generally do not pre um, present a problem to, to traditional Calvinist theories of, of predestination because, of course, you don't know. <laughs> and bodily infirmity or any symptoms of anything um, can be read either way. The real issue is with intellectual sort of disability. And here, because Calvinism puts, um, or, or did put really um, a premium on the idea of cognition and understanding, I mean, you need to be able to sit there, as you guys are now, and be able to, to be inspired by that sermon. But of course, you need, um, you need fertile ground to do that. And the, there are so many discrepancies in this theology, they, they honestly can't agree. And there are some very extreme individuals, like the likes of Samuel Rutherford, who some of you may have heard of, who suggest that um, those with cognitive issues should be treated like children, and therefore not allowed to communion. But then others just hold their hands up and say, we can't understand God's grace, so, so other things might be happening that equate to cognition, but that we don't understand. So some are very aware of their limits of their own knowledge, but the real issue is, is cognition. That's what they all struggle with. I mean, Calvin never talks about this stuff. Amazing. It's the only thing he doesn't talk about. Um, so really, that's the main, the main issue. Hey, that was fantastic. Uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering from the evidence if there was any kind of indication of certain disabilities being looked on more severely than others, um, whether that be physical or co cognitive or, yeah. Yeah. So again, in theory, no. Theologically, there shouldn't be. Um, you do see parishioners reporting on the disabilities of others and using it as a kind of rhetorical trope. Um, and ministers do this in their sermons as well. So they're, they're, it does suggest that there is a, a spectrum of how they see how severe these are, but they use sort of biblical precedents to talk about. But in, in practice, um, some witnesses to cases, i.e. the laity, will suggest some, some actions are more disgusting because of a certain condition. But I have never seen that affect the outcome of a case. Um, and really, it often comes down to the personal morality of that person. So they don't deny that those with disabilities have differing levels of morality, as, as, as do the rest of the congregation. So in that way, they, they don't differentiate in any strict term, no. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.